What's going on, everyone? My name is Trevor Fernandes Lenkevich. I'm the writer, creator, editor of Area 51, The Helix Project, a sci fi noir comic book that takes place in 1970s UFO hysteric America. Under the shadow of the Cold War, the dangerous Colonel Winters enacts his secret government project known as The Helix Project, where they take the original genetic samples of the being that crash landed in Roswell, New Mexico in the 50s during the Eisenhower administration graft their DNA onto soldiers in order to create super soldiers with the capability to manipulate their DNA on a molecular level. But the real question is, when it comes to that power, at what cost does it come, and to who? Now, this third issue that we're currently kickstarting right now, link in the description below, finds our protagonist after having made one of the most important decisions of his life, one that would reverberate throughout the rest of of it, in fact. Uh, he is faced with the man that took everything away from him. So where does he go from here? And this third issue is by far the best so far. Actually, you can see a little bit of the variant cover art to issue three feature right here on this banner. But today, we're here to talk about the comic book script, the uh, process behind it, the different styles of comic book scripting, what they're uh, supposed to accomplish in a practical sense, how the approach to doing so may vary depending on your artistic collaborator because they are going to interpret information in very different ways. And by they, I mean, hopefully, if you're continuing to do comics and you're working with a wide variety of people, each one of them is going to sort of have a different ask of you as an artist. And to a certain degree, you are going to want to write to their strengths, understand their weaknesses, and cater the way you write your script toward that. With all of that out of the way, let's get into talking a little bit about the format of a comic book script. What is it? Well, really, it's just the organization of necessary story information to be translated by your artist. And so this can be a number of things. Uh, because there are so many different hands and steps that the script will go through throughout the process, right? You have from the writer to the editor, from the editor back to the writer for reworks, then on to your artist, back to the editor, then on to your inker, back to the editor, then on to your colorist, back to the editor, then on to your letterer, Per probably even before then back to the writer for a pass because in some situations and many situations actually uh, the writer doesn't like to dialogue the page until they've seen the art itself so there are a lot of different ways to go about this so as I mentioned previously you're gonna have the Marvel method of scripting which was made popular by Stan Lee because back in the old timely days as they transitioned into Marvel Comics uh, he really didn't have time to uh, go really hands-on with the scripts because he was writing god a dozen if not dozens plural uh, of books for Marvel so really all he had the time to do was lay down the plot the basics of who the characters were and what was happening and we'll go into um, an example of that in a moment but then we have the full script which is a, a little bit more akin to a spec script of a television show or a film uh, it just goes into the detail lays down the visual beats a little bit of pacing it can also have design notes and things like that um, and anything really that you want the artist to translate so even if it's not uh, you know tangible to the character if it's a, a feeling or a sensation that you want to be reflected in some way shape or form you want to put that in the script because either that's going to be reflected by your artist your colorist your letterer whoever uh the note is for so now the question is how do you learn the format of writing a script and i would say first of all start researching screenplays look at the economy of the language because it has to be rather tight, right? You're not writing a prose novel. You don't really have the space. Uh, and really, you don't want to bore the artist with the script because then they're prone to missing details. You want to keep the script uh, pretty much... I mean, you just don't want it to be everything but the kitchen sink. You want it to be whittled down to what is necessary and effective to tell the best story you can possibly tell and convey all the information that is necessary um, and it so it doesn't mean that it needs to be you know a page for the whole issue but it also doesn't need to be a hundred pages for a 24 page comic uh, so you'll find your balance in, in the style that you prefer to write and honestly 
y you won't really perfect it until you've written scripts that have been translated by art probably more times than I've done it, right? Like, I've only had three issues translated into art. I've written six scripts, and um, I find my technique changing at least a little bit with every successive script. And once I go back to edit some of those scripts as the art comes in for prior issues, they continue to change. So, like I said in the last episode regarding not being beholden to your outline, don't be beholden to your scripting style. If you find a way to tell the story that's going to be more effective or to convey the necessary information to the artist in a more effective way, uh, then do it. And that more effective way might change depending on the artist, right? And, and the, how they are able to interpret information. So keep that in mind. Another way to look into writing scripts, uh, I think, uh, is simply buying collected graphic novels with bits of script at the end and that was one of the most informative things for me you know in my sandman absolutes there are neil gaiman scripts in there in my batman court of the owls absolute which we'll be using uh in this video as an example uh it also has pages of scott snyder's script pretty well relatively early on in his career so uh we're going to be taking a look at that but these are great resources for fledgling comic book creators because you have the pages right there to flip back to. You can look at how that textual information that Scott Snyder is writing is translating onto the page. And I think that is really invaluable for anybody looking to make a comic. But it's also going to be kind of great for like comic book reviewers out there. Begin to build the language or understand the process by which it's made so that you know what you're critiquing. And eventually, if you put the time and thought into it, you'll learn how to critique it, I think, at least. And again, disclaimer, I'm not the end-all be-all. Sorry. If I say something that offends you, it's my opinion, and that's okay. Uh, also, offending you is okay, because I don't really care. I'm just here to share my experiences. That said, let's get into some different scripting styles. All right, so getting into the end of Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's Batman number one, which was the premier Batman issue of the New 52, um, we're going to cut towards the end of the book. So spoilers for a 10-year-old comic book story. Um, page 21, right? So this is how Snyder breaks down the page. 21.1, being 20, page 21, panel 1. Large, referring to the size of the panel. The crime scene. A man pinned to the wall of his loft by dozens of antique throwing knives. The body should be in bad shape. It's been pinned to the wall for almost a week. As for the pose, the scene should be reminiscent of one of those circus performances where someone is strapped to a wheel and spun around while a knife thrower tosses daggers and always just misses. Now, you'll hone into that and, and what that description implies for a little bit later on in the book, meaning the absolute final page, because uh, it all has this sort of symbiosis here that's going to contribute to the ending. And you notice here that Snyder isn't over explaining the moment. He's giving a uh, seemingly like esoteric uh, description of the pose, you know, of this dead body, as you can see over on this side here and in the layout there. But he's giving himself enough time to leave whatever excess description for later. Moving on, he says, the thing here though is that every knife has hit the victim all on purpose so that there should be knives in his arms, legs, stomach. One long one, the kill shot, going right into his mouth, pinning his head to the wooden wall behind. The man himself is a painter in his 50s. He should look a little rackish, maybe a big broad guy he was at least two weeks ago. His loft should be filled with large-scale paintings and canvases. So, one thing that I've found very common in first panels, especially when they are setting up a brand new scene, is that they will be the most descriptive when it comes to developing a sense of setting, maybe a sense of character design and or uh, sort of style, right? Like what they're wearing. So he includes the dialogue here, which again, by full script, like many who do full script, Snyder pens at least his first draft of dialogue early on in the process before the page is even drawn. So, as you can see on this end here, it is a large panel. You're getting it at about waist height, so it's a pretty neutral view of the scene. Um, what you're really meant to focus on is this central character almost sort of crucified to the wall there. Um, and 
you'll also notice too the color is a really nice way to draw the eye you notice around here we have sort of dark burnt oranges and muddled greens and then you know uh, Bullock's coat which is the same Batman in black but that that splotch of red and that really 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 white skin tone there it helps to keep the eye focus centrally and I know that's uh, an art discussion but it's always worth noting you go on into the second panel Batman inspecting the body Harvey there too and you notice going on into these different panels is he's doing exactly what I wrote in that annotation before about getting straight to the point and being as efficient with his language as possible so that he's not overwriting and there will be times where you may have to have larger descriptions maybe a sense of emotionality or mental state but knowing that he's writing Batman in a scene like this it's it's normal for him this is the day-to-day -day finding a gruesome murder victim so there is really no need to uh, develop a an emotional reaction from Bruce right because we're seeing this from his perspective so keep that in mind as well what perspective are we seeing this from how should we feel and it's important to include that because even if you don't quite know how to explain how you want that delivered or rendered the artist may be able to come up with something based on what you're looking to evoke keep that in mind but as you go through the rest of the panels here you notice one Scott isn't dictating panel size or camera angle or anything like that so you can go as far as to do so but he's letting Capullo do the work when it comes to developing the shot he's just sort of giving him the subject matter of what should be in the shot or a little bit of the behavior of the characters and how they're interacting in three-dimensional space um, or at least in this world's three-dimensional space so keep that in mind you don't always need to call camera shots angles size whatever uh, if you a don't know it or b aren't confident in it let the artist do the work so moving on in the into the next page uh, it's really not a lot of script again he's being very brief and just giving the necessary visual information and it's interesting because you hear all of them um, these conversations about how Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo didn't get along at first and how Greg felt like Scott overwrote and for a full script this isn't a lot of detail you know this is maybe a third of a page which is is not a heck of a lot so I find that really interesting um, in, in sort of taking an observation at how their collaboration panned out but it's very simple again it's it's very cold it's very unemotional brief just giving the information Capullo needs uh, and will then translate so panel one of page 22 which is Batman looking at a wall looking at a painting ever the detective and Capullo I think does a nice job here at setting up this really really relatively large wide shot uh, with these two inset panels for smaller gestures or movements um, what this does is give a sense of, of the space one and how sort of claustrophobic it is gives a sense of the overall scheme of the of the moment and, and a sense of mood and then when he makes these small detective like moves as something as simple as moving the painting he's going to close in with a smaller thinner inset panel that allows your eye to focus and then obviously you go on into bullets reaction so uh, it's it's a quite nicely this 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 page is very nicely laid out in terms of the storytelling and how it is delivering visual information panel two this is a typo obviously uh, Batman taking the painting down Batman waiting for Harvey to hand him a cigar Batman approaching the wall with a cigar Harvey aggravated in the background Batman about to touch the wall with a cigar again very brief bare bones but it's efficient moving on into page 23 again he, he gets back to calling at least what, what what he's doing for a large panel as they reveal that something was written down in the, the flammable linseed oil on the wall and it's a large flaming message saying that Bruce Wayne will die on Sunday and obviously I think it makes sense for this big reveal to have the larger panel space now again he could have gone more specific about angle this that the other thing but he's letting Capullo do a lot of the work here which is a testament to the collaboration and this is great for artists out there as well think about how the shape size angle 
and gestures of the panel contribute to the sense of time and the way time is going to flow throughout the scene, the moment, whatever you want to call it. Obviously, we have this big, large panel. We're going to hang on this moment for sure. And it's a big moment in the story because there's a prophecy about Bruce Wayne, who is under the mask there, reading about the potential of his own death. And it's in fire. And it's a cool reveal. So we're going to hang on this and we're going to give it time. But then when you go down to the next tier of panels, we're doing these thinner, more close up shots, moving as far as doing an extreme close up here because we're not spending a lot of time. What it does is help to focus the eye in on gesture. We're not getting a look at Bullock's eyes here. We're not getting a sense of humanity. You know, Bullock uh, isn't a fan of Bruce Wayne, clearly. So he's not, we're, we're not going to pull in tight on his face and, and get this surprise reaction or this scared reaction. But you can get enough just by the lower profile of uh, his face. And then you pull in on Bruce squinting here. And it, it helps to set up a sense of tone. It helps to set up... Uh, the idea that he is now speculating and processing what's going on before him, the sense of focus. And then moving down further, not super large panels, but we're using this unified vertical layout on the bottom end here to sort of signify a pretty much equal passage of time between these three moments, despite the fact that some have more dialogue than others. So what's happening here is that Capullo is controlling a sense of pace a sense of tone, a sense of mood through this layout. And this is important when writing the script because if you are calling various layout design features or what have you, you want to make sure that you're also considering the flow of time and how that is going to affect the experience of reading the comic. And then moving on into the last page, you know, Scott begins to dictate a little bit more about the panel sizes. You'll see panel one is small, panel two is small, panel three is small, and panel four is large for the big reveal because, again, he wants you to sit on this image. And what's great is he's not telling you too much, right? In the last page, you took a DNA sample of skin from under the victim's nail. And he's not over talking about it. What he's doing is simply showing Alfred in the cave with the screen saying DNA match Dick Grayson. Now, it's not always going to be as explicit as actual text that's sort of on the screen or on a computer screen or on a piece of paper within the moment. It might be visual gesture or expressionism, but he's allowing the art to do a little bit more of the work without over speaking. And that's what I find to be pretty consistent throughout this script is that Scott Snyder isn't overdoing anything. He's not overwriting. Based on my understanding of his work, especially earlier on in his career, the script feels pretty sparing in the details, but it's really efficient and it shows off both his and Greg Capullo's level of craft, despite the fact that they didn't get along at this period in their collaborative relationship. So next up, we're going to look at uh, two pages from the second issue of Area 51, The Helix Project. Uh, along with pages of my raw script, this was the unedited version, I believe. Um, uh, and, and for those of you that are looking for a good software to write scripts uh, or to help you format them, I like to use Fade In. It's a screenwriting software, but uh, a lot of folks use Microsoft Word or Google Drive. I just happen to like Fade In. There's a free download version, which is the one that I use. Let's talk a little bit about the page of script compared to the page of actual comic here. So page six, I usually have like an overriding um, note, you know, page six, seven panels. We do not see the Colonel's face throughout the whole scene. He's disconnected from us and that should feel menacing eerie. Like I said before, um, it doesn't have to be anything that's really tangible, I guess, in the scene. It can be a sense of, of, of atmosphere or tone like I did here. So let's go into this. Panel one, medium close-up low angle and, and as you can see here sometimes we will throughout the collaborative process talk between the time that I deliver the script and the time that Marcelo or your artist is going to render it or draw it and we decided to change the angle so medium close-up low angle we're looking up at the side of a laboratory counter a lifeless grotesque arm a product of experimentation hangs off its side an array of monitors and lab equipment populate the background and like I said it changed ever so slightly but we pull into panel two, full shot, your choice of angle. I gave him the angle, but I had an idea of how I wanted to frame it. 
were in a different room within the same lab. Multiple lifeless bodies lay across tables, all of them with various patterns of patchwork skin grafted to them in an assortment of textures. They barely resemble humans. And then we get an off-screen bit of dialogue, which, again, we talk about uh, how this is going to act symbiotically with my description at the top of the page, where I say we're not going to see his face, he's disconnected from us, and that should feel menacing, and we're going to get this off-screen dialogue which disconnects us from Winters. I ask for soldiers, and you give me monsters. Disappointing. We'll have to make more direct use of the source then. Panel 3 is a cowboy shot at about hip level. Left side of the panel is going to be framed by Winter's waist. Again, we're going to see Winter's uh, and his body language to some extent, but you're not going to see his face. And it's mostly to articulate just how easy and unemotional he is about this whole process and the nervous scientist who shout out to Dustin Remy who uh, was one of our backers on issue two that paid to get his likeness drawn in is nervous you know and so a scientist in a white lab coat quivers in fear we're looking at him from a three-quarter view just behind Colonel Winters the colonel is tall imposing and the scientist has to look up slightly to meet his glare we cannot see Winters expression but the scientist's body language tells us everything we need to know and we move into the dialogue he's just warning the colonel about uh, the integrity of the specimen if they are to overtax the source the source uh, relating to the last page splash of issue one and so you move on into panel four and again we're focusing on tight gestures we're making this scene feel generally claustrophobic with the closest thing we get to an establishing shot being panel two despite not being that as much uh but we're gonna make this feel cla claustrophobic and disconnected and this is all going to contribute to a sense of tone, mood, tension, so on and so forth. But Colonel Winter's muscular weathered hand lands curiously on the grotesque arm from panel one. His demeanor is cold, rigid, and devoid of life. And this is uh, one of, I think, the most entertaining sequences of dialogue for me to write because he begins to question this scientist who is experimenting on these things that were thought to be myths or science fiction um, about God, uh, whether he believes in God. And... There's this visual motif here in panel five, where I describe it as Winter's thumb running across the uh, this this rough arm uh, that's almost been calcinated, right? It's just deprived of life in any matter, where he's shoving his finger into a wound. Um, and this is also used later to give the reader a hint that this character, Colonel Winters, has been involved in the Helix Project for over a decade. I also thought it would contribute well to his disconnect and how sort of sadistic this character is. So uh, he asks, do you believe in God as he rubs his finger into the wound of, of this dead soldier uh, who he's been experimenting on. We come into this medium close-up uh, of sorts where uh, it's a high angle from Winter's perspective over his shoulder that, that gives us the sense of looking down ever so slightly on the scientist to, uh, for all intents and purposes, give Winter's the high ground, make him look physically superior and dominant in the scene. He's, he's putting his hand on the scientist's shoulder, signifying his control of the moment. Again, using hands here a lot in the way that uh, we're portraying Winters. He's very cold, he's very active though, uh, and he has a lot of agency. There's an eerie atmosphere of uncertainty in the air. Eldritch is nervous, taken off guard by the colonel's question, and obviously, you know, he stutters a bit, and, and the colonel goes, that's a shame. And we cut to this medium shot at near ground level behind Winters. We're experiencing this moment more through Colonel Winters than anyone else, and I wanted this to feel easy for him. I wanted this villain to feel so cut off resolute in his agenda so yeah he he snaps the guy's neck fucks him up and you get into the final panel of the scene it's a medium shot near ground level behind winters off screen colonel winters is choking the life out of the eldritch he's dissatisf dissatisfied by anything short of excellence and the scientist embodies that to him in this moment on the screen are their legs they should be very subtle implication of that eldritch eldritch is being snuffed out based on the way that he is standing and uh, as you can see, I'm using the demonstration version of the software. So we have a small sound effects note that I gave to the letterer, Taylor Esposito. And after he receives his answer from Eldritch, you, you almost think that 
he is choking him out because of some weird religious thing but that was just this this really interesting way to preface it and frame the character and so you get into that panel eight it's a medium close-up uh, exact ang angle and shot size is panel seven and this is another situation where marcello and i after giving him the script discussed it and, and found a better way to set up the panel and the camera in order to really push that that tone and that evocation so instead of pulling slightly closer on Eldritch we're getting really intimate we're pulling into his face expressionless eyes open blood running um, and as it's described here Eldritch has collapsed to the floor dead the grip of the colonel's hand was forceful enough to break the man's neck Eldritch was one of the many necessary casualties of Colonel Winter's operation uh, and I make a specific note to my artist here Marcelo I'd like to play with the focus here Similar to what we did in the subway scene from issue 1, I can't decide which is more chilling, leaving the body in focus or making the dead body slightly blurred. I really want to evoke a sense of Colonel Winter's severe disconnect from people. He doesn't care about them, and this killing means absolutely nothing to him. So, it's one of those moments, like I said earlier, where I didn't quite know uh, how I wanted to enhance the scene visually, so I left Marcelo a note in order to let him work his magic. And we move on into this next scene, which is a splash page. Uh, and I love this splash. It, I think it just says a lot and communicates a lot through the singular image of him just stepping over the body like it's nothing. You know, and, and this is after he has this conversation or begins this conversation about God, right? He says he doesn't believe in God. He says, I tried to believe in men once, but my patience is thin. I had to learn a great many things, son. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. And as as he steps over the lifeless body of somebody who he felt was a restraint on what he wanted he decides to do it himself stepping over the body and again we're, we're going at this much more extreme low angle ground level in fact uh, as a means to really really focus in on the sense of dominance here and it's eerie and despite the dialogue it almost feels too quiet for what just happened here consistent with the previous page we cannot see winter's facial expression but we are keyed into his detached personality through his movements and dialogue around him is the plethora of dead discarded and blighted soldiers laid to torturous rests on the laboratory tables colonel winters is a relatively quiet but forceful monster this man is the lone survivor in a room full of men he's murdered in one way or another and that's it for the chronicles of a comic book creator i really hope that you all found this informative whether you are an aspiring creator a reviewer or just a fan looking to admire a little bit more about the process obviously with any of these videos there's always more that could be said but i am actually preparing for my first convention appearance at terrific con at the mohegan sun uh, this weekend starting july 30th through august 1st if you happen to be able to stop by stop by and say hi i'll be at booth f3 and while you're here, I really hope that if you found this information useful that you leave a like on the video, comment down below letting me know your thoughts on the sort of lesson, uh, and share it with more people that you think might be interested. And if you can, click the link in the description below. Consider backing my comic, Area 51, The Helix Project, issue number three. The first two issues are made readily available through this campaign. I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this project, and if the content that I provided for you today means anything. It would mean a lot to me if you would consider supporting the book. So thank you guys so much for watching. Consider backing Area 51 The Helix Project on Kickstarter, and we'll catch you guys next week.